Thanks for checking out this video. I hope it's encouraging to you. I hope it helps you grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you're in the Tulsa area, we would love to have you join us at Christian Chapel so that you could not only grow in your knowledge, but you could grow in your relationships in experiencing God together. If you live in another part of the world, I wanna encourage you to take all you can from this resource, but also plug into a community of believers where you live. God's created us not only to know about him, but to experience him together. And that's done best in the context of the local church. Hope this blesses you, hope you enjoy it, and I hope God speaks to you through it. I'm glad you're here today. If you're a guest, my name is Chris. I'm the pastor here at Christian Chapel. And this morning we are pressing pause on our series through the Ten Commandments. We're going to hear from one of the missionaries that we support um, in January, if you were here then, you were with us when we rolled out our Kingdom Builders Giving. This is how we fund uh, missions and extra local ministry around the world. Christian Chapel is a church that was started by a former missionary, and from our earliest days, uh, the support and participation with taking the gospel to people who have never heard about Jesus has been uh, one of the core elements of our DNA. Um, historically and, and continuing to this day, we give away between 20 to 30 percent of our annual budget each year uh, to support missions and missionaries working around the world. Kingdom Builders is over and above giving. Many of us made commitments to do that. We're supporting global missions, uh, local ministry, and next generation investments with those gifts. Our goal for this year was to raise $300,000 that we would give away, um, and we are right on track to do that. So thank you so much for your faithful giving there. We have about uh, $40,000 to $50,000 that we're hoping to raise this last part of the year. The good news is we have almost fully funded all of our commitments to missionaries that we support on a monthly basis. We have fully funded Royal Family Kids Camp through Kingdom Builders Giving. And this last little stretch of the year, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it in November, but this last stretch of the year, we're really uh, targeting some of our project giving. So uh, participating with crusades in Brazil, water wells in Africa to help build a seminary in Belgium and some other things here in our local community as well. So we'll tell you more about that. But this morning, we're going to get to hear from one of the missionaries we support, Stephen and Bailey Kurt, our longtime friends of Christian Chapel. Stephen actually is the son of Bill and Barbara Kurt, missionaries that Christian Chapel supported for a long time. As you leave the parking lot this morning, you'll see our missionary and residence house across the street. That's a home the church owns, provides for missionaries when they're back, raising funds and connecting with supporters. When Stephen was a teenager, he lived in that home with his parents while they were making connections. And then uh, throughout the course of his ministry and God's call to missions, we've been privileged to partner with him as well. Stephen and Bailey are a great couple. I consider him a, a close friend, a great trusted advisor. So will you join me in welcoming Stephen and Bailey this morning? Well, it's a joy to uh, be here this morning with you guys. And I'm going to allude during the message to uh, some of the ministry that we're involved in. Um, but I, I just really felt that God dropped this word in my heart. So if it's okay with you, we're just going to jump right into uh, the word today. And we're going to turn to uh, Romans chapter 15 together. So I'll give you a moment to find it if you still have hard copy uh, page in ink or if you have electronic digital copy or it may even be on the uh, screen up here. And uh, while you're finding it, you heard uh, Pastor Chris allude to the fact that uh, my parents have been missionaries in Kenya. My entire life, I was actually born there. Um, so my favorite cheesy joke, which I've shared before here at Christian Chapel, is that I'm really an African-American. So as I share these remarks with you this morning, take it as an African-American's perspective on missions, okay? Um, so we're going to go directly to verse number 8, and we're going to pick this up uh, in the narrative. Paul says, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. Now notice that's key. Promises made to the patriarchs are being confirmed, okay? So that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, and Gentiles will hope in him. Therefore, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm going to jump to verse 16. Paul says, I am a minister of Christ to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way round to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And then finally, we jump to verse 25. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. This morning, I'd like to uh, talk to you on this uh, subject of missions matters, okay? Missions matters. Now, I know we have sophisticated academic people in the room like Dr. Daniel Isgrig, so I came up with a little bit more of a sophisticated title just for him, which would be Pauline Pneumatological Principles for Missiological Momentum and Ecclesiastical Expansion. But that's probably a little bit deep for uh, most of us, all right? So can we just agree today that missions matters is a good title for the message? We have consensus in the house? All right, great. Now, Romans is an interesting uh, book, okay? And what we know about um, Romans is that Paul's going to teach on some pretty lofty theological terms. He's going to identify things such as propitiation. He's going to talk about justification, sanctification, uh, all based on this idea of grace by faith. Um, but if you come here to, when we come here to Romans chapter 15, this to me is the missions chapter of the most important theological book in the New Testament, okay? And Paul's closing remarks are going to focus on his passion, and I believe Paul's passion has always been missions. And it's almost like he's saying, in the midst of all of the intellectual and theological issues that I've identified in Romans 1 through 14, don't forget that mostly, the most important thing is that missions matters, okay? Okay? And I think to illustrate this idea, we look at key words, okay? I teach a lot on uh, this idea of expository preaching, and I always tell my class, if you want to understand the direction of a passage of Scripture, you look for re- uh, repetitive themes or repetitive words. Did you notice as we were reading this, one word keeps jumping out over and over again? It is the word Gentiles, all right? And it's the Greek word ethne. It's where we get the word in English ethnic. It's the idea of uh, different uh, people groups around the world. In fact, 10 times in quick succession, uh, verses 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, 18, and 27, Paul is going to write and identify this recurring theme of a promise that was made to the patriarchs. And just by way of quick review, one of those promises is Genesis 22:18, where the Lord promised Abraham, he said, and in your offspring shall all the nations, shall all the ethne of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So here is Paul, and he is focusing on this idea of missions, missions matters. Would you do me a favor and turn to the person next to you this morning and say, missions matters to Jesus. Now, here's the question I want to ask us this morning. Why would Paul have such a missional focus? Well, if you know anything about his life, it's interesting that he's a Jew who's born in Turkey who gets saved on the road to Damascus, Syria. He's trained by Christ in Saudi Arabia. He's consulted. He consults with the church leaders in Jerusalem, Israel, before they send him as a missionary to Greece, Crete, Malta, Sicily, Cyprus, Spain, and Turkey. He then visits 48 metropolitan areas across these different nations, uh, all the while maintaining Roman citizenship before dying in Italy, testifying to Caesar. Would you agree with me that this is a man who understands understood global missions, right? So the point I'm making is this. Missions isn't incidental to the Christian faith. Missions is the Christian faith. Now, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is the one who actually identified this missional theme for us. And he tells us, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? And then we see the fulfillment of it in Acts chapter 2. And it's interesting, as the Spirit is poured out, There is a list of nations that Luke gives us, and 16 of them are identified. There's Cappadocia, Mesopotamia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Cyrene, Libya, Arabia, Cretan, Medes, and Elamites. No, I'm not praying in tongues. Those are just the people that were in Jerusalem that day. The point is this. The whole purpose of the whole church is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, okay? 
Missions matters. So this morning in the time that we have, I would like to identify uh, several reminders that Paul is going to give us here from this passage of Scripture on this idea of missions matters in his personal life and correlate those how these ideas can also matter for us in any generation or in our context, a 21st century generation, right? And I promise I'll try to go as... uh, uh, as slowly as possible. My wife tells me I sometimes get worked up, so if you see her going like this on the front row, it means <laughs> slow it down, all right? All right, so the point, first point I would like to make this morning is this. Missions matters when we see the anticipation of God's promise. Missions matters when we see the anticipation of God's promise. When you look at our world today, what kind of things do you see? Now, if you watch the news at all in the last couple of weeks, you'll hear of Uh, controversy and strife between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And of course, there's always the underlying issue of the Russians and all kinds of different natural disasters. And Paul is writing to a church in Rome that is facing intensifying persecution. And he tells them here in Romans 15, 13, which has to be one of the most uh, familiar passages of scripture to Christians. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I suggest this morning that this is a glimpse into the apostolic vision that sustained Paul. Paul sees hope, and he sees hope specifically in the context of the nations. In other words, it's a nuanced hope with a specific context to it. And in order to understand it, Paul moved through this passage in quick succession, and he's going to quote through from Psalms 18, Psalm 69, Psalms 117, Deuteronomy 32, Isaiah 11, and Isaiah 52. And he's going to do this to demonstrate the connection between this idea of anticipation and hope being experienced by the nations in the person of Jesus Christ. He hits on three of the major Old Testament prophets. He quotes from Isaiah, he quotes from Moses, and he quotes from David. And I think what Paul is saying is that they anticipated the nations finding hope in Jesus, so why shouldn't you and I? Then Paul goes one step further and says that this is actually how he measures his life. He measures it as a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles so that they are an offering acceptable to God. So I think what you have happening here in um, Romans chapter 15 is you have Paul summarizing the vision of his life calling. And if he could do it, he would use one word and that word would be missions, right? Now, if Paul was a Brit, which we have... Um, maybe is Andrew here today? I don't know, somewhere. Um, I, I like to I like to use uh, British accents when I think of the Apostle Paul. I don't know why, but I do. And it's my message, so I get to preach it that way. When Pastor Chris invites you to preach on mis- mes- missions, you can change it, okay? But I like to look at this because Paul not only talks about his calling as being missions, but he sums up ecclesiology. And if you could ask him, Paul, how would you summarize your vision of ecclesiology, which is the study of the church? He says, missions, right? And then if you ask Paul, well, what about your, what about your, what about your summary of soteriology, which is the study of salvations? I think he would respond and say, missions, of course. And then if you look at pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, which we see here in this passage, he says, why, well, it's the same thing, missions, right? And then if you look here at eschatology, uh, which is the study of the end times, Paul says, and of course, it's also Missions, right, so you guys are with me. So he's saying this idea here to me is that, in other words, Paul says that the end of times isn't so much um, concerned with this idea of Gog or Magog or blood moons or 15 solar eclipse or lunar eclipses. And I'm not here to knock that, to confirm that or deny that because I don't know that. What I can tell you, though, is that Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached or proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. That word again there is ethne. It's the word Gentiles. It's the word that Paul has been reiterating throughout this passage of scripture. And then notice the end of this verse here, it says, and then what will happen? Then the end will come. So what we find in our generation is that the darkest places are starting to experience the hope that is found singularly in the person of Jesus Christ. And so personally, when I hear stories about North Korea being willing to come to the bartering table, my heart begins to rejoice because they say currently there's less than 100 known believers in the entire nation of North Korea. And if that curtain ever comes down, then you begin to see the fulfillment of Matthew 24, 14. And if you see what's taking place in Somalia, where there's actually now the largest population of Somali Christians, 
Christians is found in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You begin to see that in places where there were no known believers in the previous generations and at previous times, we see that the anticipation, the hope of what was proclaimed back to Abraham in the very beginning is beginning to be fulfilled in our generation that the dark places, the most inaccessible people groups on planet Earth are starting to put their hope in the singular person of Jesus Christ. And it's phenomenal. Missions matters because it's the anticipation of our long-awaited king returning for his glorious bride. Now, about two years ago, the Kenya Assemblies of God came to us and said, would you guys be willing to help us plant churches among the Maasai? Anybody ever watch Discovery Channel with the animals, lions, elephants, and you've seen the guys with the spirit, they go, like that, just like that. You can practice it later at home. It's kind of fun, especially if you have kids. They're like, what are you doing? Never mind. We, they, they said, would you be willing to come along and help us plant these churches? I remember going to that area as a teenager. Uh, I remember I told you I was an African-American living in Kenya. And I remember asking Dad, Dad, what about the Maasai people? How many of these people actually know Jesus personally? This would be about 20-some years ago. And Dad would shake his head and say, very few and far between. And over the course of the past 20 years, it's like God has slowly started building this anticipation, this vision among these people. And in the last five years, there's been like this cumulative snowball effect. And if we have any of the pictures, I didn't talk to you earlier, go ahead and just start scrolling through them. Uh, we have started planting churches in these communities, and it has been unbelievable to see what God is was doing. We put in a main sanctuary, we put in a children's church, we put in an elementary school so that you're servicing the needs of the community. We put in an industrial-sized playground so that all the kids in the area want to come and be at church so that attracts the families and then you put in a water well and so that meets needs for people during the dry season and I guess we don't have the pictures uh, just at the beginning of August we put in church number three and this was an area that they said five years ago there were no known believers okay and on Sunday morning during the dedication service 200 people filled this building I mean traditional garb the beads they're checking their spears at the doors you know we have gun signs outside here they have spear signs I guess right and so they're coming in and they're finding Jesus they're, 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 there's like this movement of what God is doing and I love this idea that we get to be alive in this time frame in this generation to see Jesus pouring out his spirit even in these places that traditionally were so dark. That's it on Sunday morning. That's Bailey. She's dressed in her Maasai garb. So this idea here, first of all, is this idea of anticipation, okay? Anticipation. And then the second one that we look at today is missions matters when we emphasize contribution in fulfilling God's promises, okay? Missions matters when we emphasize contribution in fulfilling God's promise. Now, that's a mouthful. The main idea to understand here is contribution. I would suggest this, that when we have anticipation, it builds and forms contribution on our behalf. Paul put it this way in verses 23 through 25. He says, Since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I know have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, I am going to Jerusalem and bringing aid or bringing a contribution to, to the saints. Paul is processing uh, a change of events in his life, and it's a closed door. He says, I no longer have any room for my ministry where I'm at. And it's interesting, if you'll notice with me, that following God's will for Paul during this season looks like him being connected to a church that believes in missions. Now, he says here that this church not only has a heart for missions, but this church puts their money where their mouth is, in the area of financial giving. He says that he is put in charge of the delivery of the missions offering from a church in Corinth area, Achaia in Macedonia, and he is transporting it to Jerusalem. And he is actually doing so, he's sharing this because he wants to prep the Roman church that he's about to go visit that they would be willing to support his ministry as he goes onward to plant the church in Spain. Now, I love this idea because it shows an international missional vision that existed in the first century church, where you have one country saying, we have to help facilitate church planting in another country, where you have the Roman church being prepped to plant a Spanish church, and you have the churches in Achaia and Macedonia being prepped to help the churches in Israel and in Jerusalem. And it's interesting, Paul uses the verb in Greek, diakoneo, okay, diakoneo, and it's where we get the idea of ministry to others. It means to serve, to wait upon, 
to be a minister of other people's needs. In other words, Paul is saying this. He's saying that missions giving is a valid expression of ministry and a valid expression of being a minister. In other words, he fully expected the body of Christ to link arms with what God was doing in that generation cross-culturally. He closes his thought by saying that, you know what, Roman church, get ready because I'm going to need your help to go plant a new congregation and a new church among the Spanish people and in Spain. And in fact, Paul writes a whole chapter about Achaia and Macedonia's uh, contribution, and he puts it in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. And it says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now, I know we've heard this passage often, but just think about this for a moment. You have a church that is experiencing extreme poverty and an abundance of joy. You put those together and Paul's challenging them to give an offering. And what would you think that their normal response would be? I thought about it and I would say that they would go, you know what? We don't really have the means. We don't really have the finances right now to be able to do this. So we're going to pray for you as you go and we'll let somebody else do the giving. And Paul says, no, actually, that's not what they did. They gave beyond their capacity. And sometimes people, people ask me, what's the most powerful service you, 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 you've been in, like in the last 10 years? And there's several of them, but the one that often comes back to my mind takes place in early 2009. I'm in uh, Gitega, Burundi. We've just planted a new church in that city. There's not even walls on the building. At the time that this story takes place, the average salary in Burundi was $30 a month. Most people had uh, only eaten one meal a day, and there's about 30-some believers who come into this church that's less than three months old, and Pastor Jerome, the pastor at the time, brings another church planter that he wants to help him start his church church and he says, would you share a few words? The man shares a few words and then he challenges his congregation of some 40 people and he says, let's take up an offering to help this guy. And you could almost feel the sigh in the room of, oh great, we have to help this guy when we don't even have walls on our own church building. And so slowly people get up and they're getting out these 100 uh, frambu notes, which equates to about four US cents and they're putting them in the offering. And I'm watching the pastor's son who's 10 years old at the time and he goes running out the back of the building and disappears for a couple minutes and then reemerges and he's holding this bundle of clothes under his arm and he runs up to the front to where his dad is, Pastor Jerome, the pastor of that church, and he goes, here, dad, take my clothes. And Pastor Jerome gets up with tears pouring down his face and he says, my son has just ran back to our house and he has two pairs of clothes and he has just given the other one, obviously he's not naked, they still had clothes on there, but the other one he has just given in the offering. And I fail for words to describe what happened next. The spirit of generosity that broke out in that church with no walls. As all of a sudden I watched Burundians taking their head wraps off. I saw men pulling off their shoes and putting them at the altar. I saw men taking off their sports coats. Every single wallet completely empty. People taking off their earrings. People running out and bringing in bags of avocados and mangoes. And it was unbelievable. They gave out of their poverty with extreme generosity. Would you be surprised today if I told you that that church in Gitega now runs 700 people and has planted eight churches in and around the area and Pastor Jerome was just elected as the general superintendent of the Burundi Assemblies of God? Can I ask us a question this morning? Why is it that in our generation we seem so reluctant to talk about money in connection with missions and the local church and giving? Or if we talk about it, we have to package it in the wrapping of give so you can get a blessing, right? If you give, you'll get dot, 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 dot. And Paul says, no, 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 no. He says, giving is because missions matters. Giving is because there is anticipation that is built in our heart that there was a promise made to Abraham those many thousand years ago that through you, the nations of the earth would be blessed and we see the fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Giving is because every believer is a minister. And at a bare minimum, they can contribute and participate in God's hope for the nations through their finances. I was thinking back as Pastor Chris and I were talking before service. I was 17 years old. I was sitting right over there somewhere where 
Steve is sitting, and I remember there was a guy on stage, I don't even remember who it was, and he got up and talked about this idea of what we used to call faith promises, which is now our kingdom fund. And I remember at 17 years old, I was a missionary. I knew about missions. I had never once considered the thought that I had a responsibility personally of contributing towards missions, giving, making an impact globally. And I remember sitting back there, and they passed out these cards, and I thought, that's kind of strange. What do they want with you? What's the card all about? And the guy explained it, and he said, just make a promise that, or not a promise, a commitment that you know that is beyond your means because if it's in your means then it's your ability to make it if it's beyond your means then it would take God I didn't even have a job I was 17 years old I used to walk to church living across the street I suddenly felt the spirit of God put the idea of 25 so I put and made a commitment for $25 and in 1997 I made my first faith promise to missions and it was amazing to watch over the next 12 months while we lived here in the MIR house as God brought money into my life so that I was able to give and contribute towards what he was doing globally Missions matters when our anticipation leads us to heart-level generosity in the form of financial contribution. Can I, can I challenge us today? What if God increases our standard of living so he can increase our standard of giving? What if, what if, what if, the, what if the finances that he's pouring into each one of our lives aren't so much for us to have the better house or the better car, although scriptures definitely talks about preparing for the next generation. This isn't a poverty message, but at the same time, what if we viewed our finances with intentionality and a place of contribution that said, you know what, maybe God's entrusting me with this because he wants to release anticipation and hope globally so that other people can experience the same hope that I've had because of my encounter and my relationship with Jesus. And then finally, we look at the third idea here from this passage as I close. And you guys know when a preacher says he's closing, it doesn't mean anything, right? Okay, just making sure we're on the same page there. Missions matters as we focus on the confirmation of God's promise. Missions matters as we focus on the confirmation of God's promise. The key word here to uh, retain would be the idea of confirmation. Let me just read again what Paul says about his ministry as he describes it in Romans uh, 15, 18 through 19. He says, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in bringing the Gentiles, there's that idea again, the ethne, to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders. Now notice this key expression, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Now, I love Paul because he's a Brit. No, not really. But I love Paul because he's not a theorist, okay? By that I mean he doesn't talk in abstractions. He talks uh, very clear. He doesn't give us philosophical arguments. He puts things tangibly and concrete with evidence of the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he is relating to the Roman church what he has personally seen and experienced during his ministry. And he tells us that the word of God was not only proclaimed through him and his team, but it was confirmed through him and his team. He says it was by word and deed, it was powers of signs and wonders and miracles, and then he adds the most important component of all, by the power of the Spirit of God. What's he saying? In other words, I suggest confirmation isn't just the result of preaching the gospel, confirmation is a result of strategic partnership with the Holy Spirit. The role of the Spirit of God when it comes to the delivery of the gospel is absolutely critical. Now, why do I say this? I say this because I know people who have shared the gospel for years and years and years, and it's like they just struggle to ever really move beyond any kind of significant breakthrough. By contrast, Paul is going to come along here in Romans 15, and he's going to give us a trajectory of what his ministry has looked like, okay? So he says he started somewhere in Jerusalem. He then went all the way around, and if you look at a map of Paul's first missionary endeavor, he's basically going around uh, Turkey, and then he kind of turns up, and he goes to this area called Ilicrium. Now, Ilicrium was the Roman province of Macedonia, and and it comprised the modern day countries of places like Albania, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Macedonia, right? So I thought about that and I decided to do some investigation, okay? So Paul starts his ministry, uh, first missionary journey, somewhere around 48 AD, all right? Now he's going to write Romans somewhere around 57 AD. And in, we just read that he said, there's no more place for me. Now, does that mean he's preached the gospel to every single person? We don't know. We just know that Paul felt comfortable that everybody in all of that area that we just described had heard the gospel. Okay. So if you do the math, 48 minus 57 is how many years? 
Nine years, right? So Paul says in nine years, without any social media, without any Twitter, without any uh, at apostle, main man, missions movement.com, whatever it may be, that Paul is going to articulate and he's going to say, you know what? I was able in nine years to take the gospel to an area three times the size of Texas. Now, I looked at that, I wrestled with that, I said, how in the world can that be? And I believe what Paul was saying is simply this. He said, the one way is that you have to combine proclamation with confirmation. Now, proclamation is important. Paul says, how can they be told unless someone goes and preaches? And how can someone go and preach unless they be sent? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. But it's interesting when you look at Paul's um, position here, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5, when he describes his own ministry, he says, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration, notice this, demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith doesn't just rest in wisdom of men, but it rests in the power of God. Now, please don't get me wrong. I love, I already told you, I love expository preaching, and I love training people to be able to extract key principles from the word of God. And when we do so, it's amazing to see how believers are edified as people get to understand the word of God better. But Paul says proclamation can never be divorced from confirmation. Paul says if we are going to be effective in the 21st century in engaging the dark places, it's not going to be because we just have a nice plausible sounding message. Although I believe it is important to focus on the intellect so that we do offer an apologetic defense of who Christ is. But Paul says at some level, There must be a demonstration of the Spirit's power that will break into people's lives that they will stand back and say, whoa, there's no possible way that that could have happened except by the Spirit of God working in and through your life. When we were preparing, uh, planning to start these church plants among the Maasai people, um, I took a trip with uh, three of my buddies, and we went over to Kenya. This was last February. And we were just driving around, and we were looking in these different areas among the uh, Maasai people. And we stopped at this one area, and it was a manyata, which is the thorn thicket that they built to keep the lions out, and they put the cows in at night so the lions don't eat the cows. And there was a group of um, Morani. Okay, the Morani are the warriors, the guy that put the uh, put the red... Um, uh, bark and stuff in their hair and they have the spears and so there's a group of like I don't know 15 or 16 of them and they invite us to come into their little hut and so we're going in there and as we sit down I felt the spirit of God speak to my heart so strong Steve you need to share Jesus with these guys but I don't want you to do it now I thought that's so weird Lord I, I'm a missionary what do you mean you don't want me to do it and I felt the spirit say you need to ask your buddy who's sitting next to you to do it he's like six foot eight he's a really big strong guy and so I leaned over elbowed him and I said hey I think the Lord wants you to share um, with these guys and he said oh no I'm not doing it he said you're the missionary you got to do it so I say all right so we go outside and again I feel it so strong the spirit of God speaks to me and says Steve you need to share the gospel with these guys but I don't want you to do it I want your buddy to do it so I elbow him again I say hey I think you're supposed to he said oh no I don't know anything the first thing about Kenya you need to do it and so I'm just about to jump into doing it and I feel the Lord speaking one more time not you him and so I'm like please would you share Jesus with these guys and he's like all right I'll do it and so he gets up and for the next five minutes, just shares a very simple message about his testimony and what it means to be a strong man, because he's 6'8", you know, and he's definitely a little bit more ripped than I am, just a little bit. And he, he starts sharing about Christ, and I, the Spirit of God just falls. All of us in this group of morons, and there's like these guys put their spears down, one guy's kneeling, people have tears, and they're just like a five-minute message. And he says, anybody here want to receive Christ, give your life to Jesus? Twelve hands go up right there on the spot. So we have a pastor with us um, from, from Kenya, and so he starts praying over them. And I share that story with you because sometimes when we talk about the power of the Spirit, we make it so, uh, can I use the word, um, esoteric. It's so mystical. And people are like, ooh, that can't be. I don't know even what that means. I don't know how to partner with that. And I share this story because sometimes walking in the power of the Spirit is so simple and it's so practical. It's just being willing to pause long enough to say, you know what? Spirit, what do you want me to speak to this person right now? And I challenge that with for you guys today that As we leave this place, as we articulate the gospel of who Christ is in this place of Tulsa, Oklahoma, do you guys know that there's churches that if you came to church today at Christian Chapel, you had to drive by a whole lot of churches to get here? Is that true? 
Do you know that most people that you talk to in Tulsa, Oklahoma know at least a little bit about the gospel? Is that true? And so we think at times that, we, you know, if we just had more powerful preaching, it's not more powerful preaching that's going to win them. It's not, it's not better just, you know, worship services, although I love worship and I love powerful preaching. I believe at some point the people of God have to stand up like Paul is talking about here. And he says, you know what? It was by confirmation where the people of God proclaimed the gospel through their lives, but they did so in partnership with the Spirit of God working in and through their lives. So we look to conclude this message today, and this time I really am closing. And we've talked about this idea of missions matters. And we've looked at these various points, this idea of anticipation. And I challenge us this morning, are we living in a place of hope and anticipation to see Christ established, his kingdom and his name made known among the nations? And then we've looked at contribution and the challenge becomes, how am I committed and how am I being involved in helping to finance what Jesus is doing on the planet Earth, in the, on this earth in the 21st century? And then finally, confirmation. How am I partnering with the Spirit of God in articulating and proclaiming the gospel to the lost, both here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as well as around the world? Could I challenge you guys, as I invite you to stand up today, that missions matters because missions matters to Jesus. And missions matters because missions is the way that Jesus intends to confirm the promise that God the Father made to Abraham way back when in Genesis chapter 11. Would you close your eyes with me? Lord, I thank you so much for Christian Chapel. I thank you for this amazing church. Lord, I thank you for their commitment to world missions. Lord, I thank you that we support over 50 missionaries every month in 30 different nations. Lord, this is a church that believes in contribution. And so, Lord, I thank you today that these words, this, this message, Lord, would, would sink down deep into our hearts again to say that we make a fresh commitment to partner with you, to see your name made famous across this globe. Lord, we're grateful for the hour that we live in because it's exciting. We believe that there are signs and indications that you are soon to return. And Lord, we are grateful that that anticipation would leave um, each of us in a place of renewed surrender and fresh vision of who Jesus is. We love you today, Lord. We thank you today. We bless you today. Um, before I turn it back over to Chris, I just, I really sense, can you just close your eyes just for a moment? There's, there's someone here and you're really struggling with despair. I'm not going to embarrass you. I know we already had a prayer time, but spirit of despair, almost of hopelessness. I just want to pray for you. Would you just wave at me quickly? If that's you. Okay, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you would encourage whoever that is for today and that, Father, they would um, walk out of this place with a new sense of the reality of who Jesus is. Lord, let your hope be released in our hearts and in our lives afresh and anew. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. You may be seated. We're going to finish this morning by giving us a chance to partner with Stephen and Bailey to plant churches in Africa. The ushers are going to come. Uh, we've got some offering envelopes there. You can also give online at christianchapel.com. If you want to be part of what Christian Chapel is doing to support ministers and missionaries like Stephen and Bailey and others all around the world, you can stop by the Welcome Center afterwards and grab one of these Kingdom Builders commitment cards. It's going to tell you more about that. You can also go to christianchapel.com slash kingdombuilders and see a list of all the things that we're partnering with this year. Uh, but thank you for considering that. Thank you for giving generously and joyfully both this morning to be part of what Stephen and Bailey are doing and also on a monthly basis to be part of these stories that are being written all over the world. So as we give, uh, the band's going to lead us in a, a new song this morning, just describing Christ as, as our source of hope and the source of hope for everyone everywhere. Thanks for watching this message. You can view more messages and watch live online on Sundays at christianchapel.com. Have a great week. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation.